Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth. Thank you, Jesus, just as it is in heaven. Praise God. We thank you this morning, Father. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. Even when we are doubtful, you remain faithful. We're so thankful, Lord, that we have a history in the lives of people that we know and family to be able to say that you are faithful, that you have never failed us. David said, I was young, but now I'm old, and I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their seed begging bread. God, you have been there for us all along the way and will. Amen to the very end. Praise the Lord, which is just a beginning for us. Praise God. Amen. Everybody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. This morning. Praise the Lord. Amen. Great job, uh, all you young people with the flags and the waving and the what have you. You're dismissed to go downstairs for Sunday school. Praise the Lord. Praise God. God's good. Amen. Nice week uh, as opposed to last week's ongoing sauna. This week is pretty nice, actually. Got a little warm yesterday, but otherwise it's been pretty good. Praise the Lord. Nice and cool, and it's always good. Praise the Lord. So, uh, glad to have all of you with us here this morning. God bless you. Somebody tell me what you get when you mix alcohol and literature. Tequila Mockingbird. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> hey, when life gives you melons, you have dyslexia. <laughs> Lemons. Anybody here know why dogs don't dance very well? They have two left feet. Okay, we'll try to move through these rapidly. <laughs> What's burnt and sticks to the ceiling? A not very good electrician. <laughs> okay, praise the Lord. Now to the real thing here. Glory to God. Again, great to have everybody here. Appreciate you being here. Let's, uh, let's get to the Word of God. I want to start uh, this morning, Peter, with Joel uh, chapter 2. And we'll read verses 23 through 32. Joel chapter 2, verses 23 through 32. You know, there's all, and we see throughout the scriptures where it talks, is speaking of God dealing with Israel and so on and so forth. But you have to remember that those things apply, obviously, under the old covenant. But true Israel are those who have Abraham as a father or the father of faith. So Jesus addressed this situation when the Jews said, we have Abraham to our father. And he said, well, if Abraham was your father, you'd be doing the works that I'm telling you to do. Because true Israel is of faith. Not, it's not a birthright. It's not a genetic thing. It's, it's the fact that you operate by faith. And uh, likewise, that's true of, uh, of the new Jerusalem, which is the church or the bride coming down out of heaven and so forth. Praise the Lord. So be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. Remember, this is, prof this is prophecy. It's, it's a prophetic uh, utterance going forth. So he tells them to be glad and rejoice in the Lord, because he's given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floor shall be full of wheat, the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, oh, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty, and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and, be, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. 
And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Praise the Lord. All right, Acts chapter 2, verses 15 through 18. Acts 2, 15 through 18. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Praise the Lord. So, on the day of Pentecost, uh, I'm on, but it's not. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. A little technology here. Oh, there you go. There we go. Praise the Lord. Pardon me. Hallelujah. I, I, uh, this is just, I, I'm just not a techie. Like, you didn't know that. I kind of, I had a card from an old buddy of mine that I was in the Marine Corps with. In fact, we hitchhiked out to uh, Colorado together and worked out there in the, some bars and different things. And uh, We were pretty good buddies. And hadn't, I hadn't seen him for about 30 years, 35 years, and I got a card from him the other day. He's down in Florida. And uh, so I finally got around to send him a card back, and so he sent me an email. <laughs> I, come down, I was down here Friday, and uh, checked the email, and, and so I responded to the email, but every time I tried to type the email in, it kept dropping out before I could finish the, my response you know, to the email. And so I, I en ended up, finally I got it, and I sent it to him, and he said, uh, got your uh, email response, thank you, times four. <laughs> So who knows how far this relationship will go from here, <laughs> so, since we can't reach each other any other way. Anyway, praise the Lord. Uh, that was what this was all about. Thank you, Mike, for pushing all the right buttons. Amen. But anyway, on the day of Pentecost, Peter, he declared that the promise of Joel in, in, in Joel chapter 2 was fulfilled, right? I mean, that's the way we have understood it, basically. Everything happening there and then on the day of Pentecost was part of this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Now, that was only the initial fulfillment of that promise. The Spirit was poured out on that day, but there's an ongoing outpouring of the Spirit and a last day outpouring of the Spirit, amen, that, that the Scripture is actually identifying here. And so it's a fulfillment of the promise of the Spirit being poured out as the early rain and the latter rain. Now, we've kind of thought of this as being, okay, uh, the early rain was what, uh, where uh, Joel was. No, there wasn't any outpouring there. There wasn't an outpouring at times. The Spirit would move on people, but there was no real outpouring of the Spirit. It was, it was very isolated and limited. So that wasn't, that's all Joel was doing was prophesying about something that was going to come way down the road, which was on the day of Pentecost. But then beyond that, there was going to be the latter rain. There was the former rain and the latter rain, the former rain being the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, okay? So the early rain was the first century. The latter rain is today. Amen. The ultimate fulfillment of Joel's prophecy is going to take place in these last days. Amen. The problem is when the church assumes that the greatest move of God is in the past. Amen. That's a, that's a misunderstanding of history, and it comes from misunderstanding the nature of God. God always saves the best for last. Praise the Lord. John chapter 2, verses 7 through 10. If we misunderstand the nature of God, then we misunderstand the works of God. Amen. He always saves the best for last. Praise God. Jesus saith unto them, fill the water pots with water. 
and they filled them up to the brim, and he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and he saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men are well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. So he kept the good wine till the last. Amen. And how many of you know wine is always a symbol or a type of the Holy Spirit? So when we're, whenever we're reading these things, we've talked about this a lot, we read them understanding that there are metaphors and there are parables and there are uh, kind of uh, spiritual truths that are being spoken in a natural way. And so we, we have a tendency to kind of read through it to find out what it is the Spirit is really trying to say to us. When you get to the book of Revelation, it's no different. It's just a continuation of that same thing. So when we get to the book of Revelation, we start seeing all these metaphorical things and, and symbolisms and so forth. It's, it's not unusual. It isn't that that's the reality. That is trying to tell us something by the Spirit so that we can receive something from God, spiritually speaking. Amen. So when God restores things, amen, Anything that's been destroyed, anything that's been broken. How many of you got some stuff that got broke, amen, that's been destroyed, that's been ripped off, that's been fouled up, right? Well, whenever God restores those things, he restores them to a place that's greater than they were originally, praise the Lord. So he isn't just going to give you back the thing you lost. He's going to give it back, amen, as we used to say in spades. You're going to get way more than you expected to get because he's not going to just give you back what you lost. He's going to give you that plus an abundance on top of it. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So Job, he lost everything, right? Tim was talking about this this morning. But when God restored him, he was given twice what he lost. Amen. Now, it's God's way. That's the way he operates. And so it's, it's the way of God to expect any. If we were to expect anything less of God than that, amen, in these last days, we know what he did in the early rain. It was magnificent. It was fantastic. We've not seen anything like it. But he's telling us, amen, in the last days, that latter rain is going to be greater than the former rain. It's, and so what we've, and believe me, we've lost some stuff from that first century, from the original outpouring. And we know that we have because people were being healed by shadows. Everybody was kind of working in unison. There was an idea that, that, that uh, the, the law has been fulfilled, that we're not under that obligation anymore. This is all about everything that Jesus has done and how we walk in that. Amen. So this is, a, this is just, if we don't recognize or if we expect anything less of God for us today, amen, in these last days, then we're just being ignorant yeah. at, at best or just totally in unbelief at worst. Praise the Lord. We've been commissioned to do what Jesus did and teach what Jesus taught, amen, and act, amen, in the way that Jesus acted. In other words, with signs and wonders following. Praise the Lord. So 2 Peter chapter 1, 1 through 4. 2 Peter 1, verses 1 through 4. So Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, of them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. So God's plan for us yes. is to actually represent him. Again, just exactly what Tim was talking about. To represent God in the earth. Amen. So God has set us up to be successful at that. He isn't give us something to do and then say, good luck, let's see how you work this out. No, whatever he's given us to do, he already had a plan for that. He's already prepared the way, amen, for it to be successful. So he's, he's telling us, he set us up. He has prepared us to successfully represent Christ by giving us the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, amen. And so the indwelling presence of the Spirit comes when we get born again. Immediately, when you get born again, you receive the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of God. The Spirit of resurrection, amen, brings, amen, our spirits to life. 
Just like God's alive. Amen. Just like the same way he breathed into Adam. He created man out of the dust of the earth, but the man, the body existed, but he didn't have that spirit. And so God breathed into him the breath of life or the spirit of God, eternal life. Amen. Jesus said, this is how we know God. Amen. That you believe him and in his son whom he has sent. Praise the Lord. So John chapter 20, uh, verses 21 and 22, Peter. John 20, verses 21 and 22. So I'm saying, I'm saying our focus needs to be on the now and what God is doing now because the now is where God is always working. Now, he's got a plan at this end time. This end time, we're part of it because we're here right now. Amen. And God wants us to understand if I did this for that first century church to bring this message, to bring this reality, amen, to mankind, that why would you think I would do anything less? Amen. In the last days, when it's an even greater need, amen, than there was in the early church. Praise the Lord. We've got far more corruption, far more violence and hatred and, and variance and anti-Christ and all this other stuff that goes on today than they had then. Praise the Lord. And so it's going to take a greater move of God in this last day for people to be convinced, for people to see, amen, and understand the love that God has for them. So then said Jesus to them again, peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now these are disciples. Amen. This has always kind of confused me a little bit. But here's the deal. At, this is what he does. This is why Jesus is still here. Now we think, well, the Holy Spirit couldn't be poured out. Well, of course it could because Jesus received it. Amen. Amen. So we don't think of it as being that. We think Jesus has got to go away for this to happen. But no, the Holy Spirit's come on people in the past. And Jesus certainly had the, the uh, authority, amen, to give the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. And so at his, when he says this, amen, he breathed on him. And then at his ascension, a year later, I don't know exactly what the time frame is. But then Jesus tells these same people that the Holy Spirit was going to come on them. Well, some people are going to receive it because they're going to get born again. These people were already, at that point, Jesus had breathed the Holy Spirit into him. Receive ye the Holy Spirit, he says. That's hard to misunderstand or misinterpret. But he tells these same people who had received the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit's going to come upon them on the day of Pentecost. Amen. So the Holy Spirit was already in him, but it was going to come on him. And just like the word outpouring suggests, the Spirit of God comes on people like rain. That's what the metaphor that that Joel was using, amen, when he prophesied this. So this heavenly invasion is God's first answer to prayer when Jesus prayed, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The only way that can happen is by the Spirit, amen. So look, look Paul, Paul said in uh, Romans 14, 17, Peter, he says the kingdom of God is the Holy Spirit. Remember another place he says the kingdom of God is not observable or it's not tangible. It's in you. Praise the Lord. So for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Praise the Lord. So the kingdom of God, amen, is in the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. So Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 19. And to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Praise God. I mean, that's powerful. God's ultimate provision for us is to be filled with the fullness of God. Now, remember another place that says in Jesus, the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him bodily, and he has given that to us. Praise the Lord. See, it's one thing to get used to the idea that God actually wants to live in us. But it's quite another to realize God intends to fill us with his fullness. Yes. Praise the Lord. So that, that's, that's so that in filling us, he can overflow through us. Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. It's like a glass of water. The glass isn't full until it's running over. Now, we don't fill glasses that way unless you want to mess. Unless you have grandchildren. Praise the Lord. And then that will happen regardless. You know what I'm saying, though? A full glass is a glass that overflows. It's not full until it overflows. That's how you know that it's actually full, right? So let's look at this. The kingdom of God cannot be reduced, amen, to talk or to just ideas or theology, principles. The kingdom of God is power. 
Now hear me. The kingdom of God is power. Praise the Lord. It's not just theory. It's not just theology. It is power itself. Praise the Lord. Amen. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us, which is the kingdom of God or which is the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's what's working us. That's the power. Amen. The absence of the supernatural is unacceptable. And that's why we, have, that's why we do what we do when we're sharing here in the, and so on and so forth. And with the idea that if somebody is, is sharing something and all of a sudden they get a witness from the Holy Spirit and they feel led to then pray for that person or to lay hands on them or to give a word of prophecy or to tongues and interpretation, whatever it might be, that's where the power is going to flow from. Amen. You know, if God is here, there's power. If God is here, there's no, nothing that can be withheld from us if we believe. Amen. He is power in, in its raw form, in its truest form. Amen. Psalms chapter 67, verses 1 and 2. Psalm 67, 1 and 2. Praise the Lord. God be merciful unto us and bless us and cause his face to to shine upon us, that, the, that thy way may be known upon earth, thy saving health among all nations. Praise the Lord. Ezekiel 39, 29. Ezekiel 39, verse 29. Praise the Lord. Neither will I hide my face anymore from them, for I have poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel, saith the Lord God. So God's revealed in the outpouring of his spirit. That's how we know him. That's how we interact. Amen. Psalms 103, verse 7. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of God. So Moses said, he said, if, if your presence doesn't go with us, we're not going. Now they're out in the wilderness and he tells the Lord, don't lead us. If you're not going with us, don't lead us out of here. Don't, don't move us from this place, right? And the reason for that was Moses had developed this relationship with God. It's like a friend, like Abraham. Amen. And he said uh, he preferred the wilderness with God to the promised land without God. Yes, if you're not going, we're not going. I'm, we'll stay right here in the wilderness. We'll, we'll be better, better off here in the wilderness with you than we would be in the promised land without you praise the lord and so he's saying i want your presence i'm not interested in religion your presence is what's going to keep us amen and this is what's happened with the church we've got everything flipped over amen to where we're more interested in the religious thing or the promised land or what the promised land might give us than the one who's given the promise amen and that gives us all kinds of issues down the road so through christ god made it possible for every citizen of the kingdom to see the kingdom. Praise the Lord. To see the promised land. To be able to experience that. Amen. And so look at, let's look at this now in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1. We've talked about some of these things before. But uh, I, I'm going a little bit different direction here this morning. But again, Revelation is nothing more than an extension of everything. The other 65 books of the Bible. It's not, a, it's not an addendum. It's not another book. Or I shouldn't say that. It's not another religion being taught or some other fact. It's a continuation of what we've had all the way from Genesis. Amen. And so after this, he said, I look and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as if it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Now, this is Jesus talking to us. You say, well, he was talking to John. But he wouldn't have written it down except that he wanted us to know this. So it's him talking to us before we were here. We were in him before the foundation of the world. So he's talking to us, and he's talking to us before we even get here, amen, so that we would know what it is he's expecting us to understand in these last days. After this, praise the Lord, after what? After the first three chapters of Revelation, which is telling the church where they've fallen short. They haven't trusted in, in the finished work of God. They, haven't, they believe that it was about their works and their efforts and so on and so forth. And I won't go back and try to preach all that, but that's what he's talking about. After I've explained those things to you and revealed to you how it's supposed to work, amen, here are the things that we need to change. 
Amen? Here's the things that we need to change our minds about if we're going to experience this outpouring or this latter rain, amen, that he's talking about. Amen? He says, after these things, after you overcome, how do you overcome? By the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. By what Jesus did. Amen? After you overcome, you're going to discover the victory is in everything we've been told to do. Amen. Hallelujah. The victory is in what we do that He's told us to do. Amen. Praise the Lord. So these things have to... Th these are the things we need to change our mind about. If we're going to experience the outpouring of the latter rain, we have to recognize that whatever He's told us to do, that's where the victory is and that's what we have to do. Amen? So, for example, law and grace. He said, Paul said, we don't put a, a piece of uh, new cloth into an old garment or new wine into old wineskins. Amen? Because every time we're exposed to a promise from God or an act of God, amen, then that we are forced to respond. And our response is either faith or unbelief. Amen? And our response shapes who we are. Praise the Lord. It shapes what we believe we can do, what we believe God has empowered us to do, and what God is wanting to do through us in this last day. Look at Genesis 28, verse 16. This is a story, and you all know it well, but it's, uh, you know, Jacob is asleep on a rock. He wakes up. He has this dream, a stairway to heaven, angels ascending and descending. And Jacob waked out of his sleep and he said, Surely the Lord's in this place and I didn't know it. So it's possible to be right next to God and not even know it. It's, I mean, how many of you know it's possible for God, angelic beings, all those things to be right here, right now, and not even be aware of it, not even acknowledge it. Amen? John chapter 1, verse 29 through 34. And this is a perfect example when Jesus comes to John, and John's baptizing all these people in the River Jordan. And the next day, John sees Jesus coming into, unto him, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after he cometh, a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not. Now, he knew him because he was his cousin. But he didn't know him as the Messiah. He didn't know that he was God come in the flesh. He said, I knew one was coming, I just didn't know who it was. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore, am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and it abode on him. Praise the Lord. I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me upon him whom thou shalt see the spirit descending and remaining and remaining. And that's a key there on him. The same as he which baptizes with the Holy, Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. So Jesus wasn't recognized as the manifestation of God until the Spirit of God came upon Him. Right? And so that's the key phrase here is, and then the Spirit remained on Him. He hadn't remained on any prior to this. He came on people, but He didn't stay with them. He didn't remain there. With Jesus, not only did He identify Him by the Holy Spirit coming on Him as being the manifestation of God in the flesh, but the Spirit stayed with Him. It remained with Him. Praise the Lord. So, what was the nature that, of God? What was it Jesus was trying to reveal about God? All right? Look at Nahum chapter 1 and verse 7. The Lord is good. That's good enough for me right there. Praise the Lord. The Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. He knoweth them that trust Him. So, when Moses asked to see God's glory... What did God reveal? His goodness. This is how God reveals himself. And we've thought, you know, religion will tell you he reveals himself through fire and brimstone and hell and damnation. No, it's goodness. That's what really reveals God. That's what really is a revelation of God is goodness. And Jesus went about doing good for everybody. Praise the Lord. And for anybody who would receive it. Praise the Lord. So, amen. Our faith isn't in promises alone. Our faith is also in the goodness of God. Because He's good, He will not leave you or forsake you. Amen? It isn't just about He promised I'm going to bless you with this or bless you with that. It's you can believe that promise because He's good. How many ever had a promise broken from somebody? They may have meant well, 
They may just not have been, had the capacity or the ability to fulfill the promise that they made. Amen. But see, that's the difference between God. God does it because he's good and because he can. And anything he says, he will do. He will not go back on his word. His word and his name are close to the same, but he said, I'll elevate my word even above my name. Now think about that because the Jewish people won't even speak the name. It's so holy. It's so righteous. Amen. But they've missed the power. They've missed the move of God, the, the real power, which is in the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. So Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 7. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. Amen? All right, verse, chapter 5, verse 27, Peter. Chapter 5, verse 27, still of Ephesians. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy... And without blemish. Now remember, we're still talking about these last days, right? So here's the deal. The word church comes from, we know it's Ecclesiastes and so forth, but it comes from a word that literally means the called out ones. Yes. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. Now, in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 12, we're still uh, talking about the end times. It says, John hears a voice behind him and he turns to see the church. Amen. And it's represented by the candlestick. Right? you got the seven candlesticks, the seven churches, and then there's the one candlestick. Amen? So he isn't saying this is the end of the church. But he's simply saying that the church is now in Christ. Amen? It's in the kingdom. Amen? And it's in Him that we live and move and have our being. Yes. Praise the Lord. So John is saying, I turned and saw that this... The called out ones, these ones that have been called out, are, are not just randomly running around the countryside. They are in Jesus. Yes. They're identified, amen, with him. Praise the Lord. And so the, the, the let, me, let me just say it this way. The reason we're not called the church after uh, Revelation chapter 4 is because we've moved into the kingdom realm or into Christ. Now, understand me. Simply put, it just means we've taken a different expression, amen, from the fourth chapter of Revelation. Sometimes we're called the bride after the fourth chapter. Sometimes it's the bride. Sometimes we're called the lamb's wife. Sometimes we're called the kingdom. And sometimes we're called the city of God. We're still active. We're still involved. Amen. These are the last days that he's talking about. Amen. So she's not called the church because she's no longer just called out. She has now been brought to a yes. promised land called Christ. Amen. Living in a house that we didn't build. We have, we're not the called out. We've been brought in, in other words. Yes. Praise the Lord. So we're, we're living in a house we didn't build. We're eating from vineyards we didn't plant. We have to shift our thinking. We've got to change the way that we think from a coming in, or excuse me, a coming out mentality, amen, to a going in mentality. Amen. amen. The church here finally becomes relevant. Yes. Now, you might not like that, but I'm telling you from my experience, now, there may, there's isolated things that happen in, in different times we've seen uh, moves of God, but I'm telling you, this is not, we're not, we haven't seen what was in that early church. We haven't seen the early rain. Amen. And he's telling us the latter rain is going to be greater than the former rain. Amen. So here he's telling us how that happens. The church finally really becomes relevant again. Amen. Because of their coming in to Christ or coming into an awareness. Amen. Of who we are in Jesus. And that happens in the last days. So it's not any great shock to me that we've been hearing uh, the grace message preached for about the last 10 years probably now. Why? Because without that, we could never get to the place, amen, where we would be going in instead of just coming out. That's right. Praise God. It's not just about coming out of the world, which many of us have heard in the past. This is about going in to Christ and then having an impact on the entire world around us. Praise God. So let's look at this now in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16.
Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Amen. Hallelujah. This is describing the beginning of a people that are fully moving in their true identity and experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit as a result. Now, the Holy Spirit's been poured out. We've, been, we've received the Holy Spirit. But if you've got the Holy Spirit and you're thinking it's still about doing this thing or doing that thing or keeping this rule or following that rule, the Holy Spirit's limited. Amen? Because you're still making it about you instead of the Holy Spirit, right? So people who... Th these, these are people. This, this is describing the people, amen, who, amen, are going to harvest the vine of the earth. Praise God. Well, the people that get this revelation are the ones that are going to be reaping this great end time harvest. Yes. Amen. Not just anybody, but the people who have a revelation of this, who have an understanding of this by the Holy Spirit. Amen. They're going to thrust in the sickle and see the greatest harvest history has ever seen. Wow. God promised it. Somebody's going to experience it. Yes. Amen. And we can make, if they weren't the last days, we can make them the last days simply by doing this. Yes. By simply believing what God has said. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 24 through 28. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 28. Praise the Lord. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and all power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. Woo. That last enemy shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is expected or accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Woo. Praise the Lord. Psalms 110, verse 1. If you don't think God has confidence in us, you need to read that again. That is amazing. Jesus not only went to the cross, but he's put everything that, everything that he went to the cross for in our hands. So that he, we can be one with him and he can be one with God again. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. Psalms 8 and 6. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. Praise the Lord. So Jesus is the word of God made flesh. Amen. But when he spoke the word, the word became spirit. And that spirit gave life. Amen. Amen. No different than when God breathed into Adam, when Jesus breathed in his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Amen. Whenever he spoke... Those words became spirit. He said, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they're life. In other words, they're spirit and spirit is what gives life. Real life, true life. The life that we have, that we live in Christ. Amen. And so when, he, when we truly recognize that we are in Christ, we're going to say what he said. Amen. When Jesus got the revelation, he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He identified, he found himself in the word of God. And he said only what his father said. Praise the Lord. When we get the same revelation, we're only going to be saying what God said instead of just the crap that comes into our head or this, the result of circumstances that we're dealing with. Amen. And so when we truly recognize, we're going to say what the Father says and our words become spirit too. Yes. Praise the Lord. When you say what God says in faith, your word becomes spirit. Amen. And that word is poured out and it's released into situations and circumstances as we speak. Life. It, it's life that's having an impact here. It isn't just saying something that sounds spiritual. But when you speak what God says, you're speaking spirit. Amen. And the spirit gives life. Yes. Amen. Praise the Lord. When the Holy Spirit is released into situations, what happens? The king's dominion is manifested or the kingdom is revealed. All right, so I don't have to, I don't got time to go into all of this this, this, this morning, but uh, you can check it out for yourself. If you go to the Song of Solomon, this is all there. You just have to read through it. But there are three rooms. Now, this is interesting because Suzanne gave me, a I've done this before, but uh, she gave me a tape series on uh, the guy from IHOP, not the Pancake House, but the International House of Prayer. 
down in Kansas City. Mike Bickle. Yeah. Mike Bickle, that's right, yeah. And uh, I was a little, you know, freaked out by it, actually, because there was a lot of, the, you know, the Song of Solomon, love, my love, this and that and the whole thing. Uh, so I had, it was kind of awkward for me to figure it out. But over time, God overcame my ignorance and my kind of fear uh, uh, of turning into Joyce Meyer. But uh, he actually, I re actually got some genuine revelation that's powerful stuff, you know. And so a lot of it, it, it connects, too, with the... Uh, uh, amen with the book of uh, Revelation. So in, in the Song of Solomon, there's three rooms. The courts of the king, the banqueting house, and the bedroom. Now it's there. You can go check it out for yourself. Now in the outer court, he takes his bride. That's us, right? He takes her for a walk. And he shows her the courts of the king. And the scripture says it takes her breath away. Amen. Anybody had a breathtaking experience with God. You know, I mean, it happens. Praise the Lord. In the second chapter, he brings her into the banqueting house, and the scripture says he stays her with flagons of wine. Now, again, remember, the, the wine is always representative of the Holy Spirit. So that's another dimension. It's Because it's, it, wine is always a symbol of the Holy Spirit. He's, taking, he's talking about moving her from one place to another. He takes her with him, and she's awestruck by what he's revealing to her. And then he takes her to the banqueting room and gets her drunk. No, I'm just kidding. No, he, he gives her the Holy Spirit. He, he pours out his spirit upon her. Amen? And so uh, it, we know that that's true because Jesus turned the water into wine. I mean, that's, it's all throughout the scripture. So, and the word here, banqueting, is a word that means to be effervescent. Praise the Lord. It's like shaking a bottle of champagne and then popping the cork. That's what he's talking about. He said it's, it's the banqueting room is like, I'm going to get you charged up and let you loose. I'm going to fill you with the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to get you effervescent. I'm going to get you up to a place where you can't contain it anymore, and then I'm just going to pop the cork on you and let you flow and blow out onto everybody that you come into contact with. Praise the Lord. Amen. So that's what happens when we are filled with the Holy Spirit in these last days. That's what God is doing. Amen. Amen. He shakes your bottle and pops your cork. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 And you begin to bubble over. Amen. You begin to bubble over in the house of wine. Yes. Amen. This is the house. This is the house, the home, the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? And it begins to, it isn't just here anymore. It becomes effervescent. It becomes hyper. Yes. Powerful until all of a sudden you can't contain it anymore and the cork pops and you blow onto everybody. You start affecting anybody and everybody around you with that same spirit because it's the wine that's coming out, right? It's the Holy Spirit that's coming out of you. Praise the Lord. So that's what happens, amen. He shakes the bottle, pops the cork, amen, and we bubble over. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. What do we call that? I call it enjoying the Holy Spirit on another level. Mm -hmm. yes. Not a different Holy Spirit, just affecting us in a way that it hasn't impacted us before, partly because we didn't know. Amen? Then he takes her into the third room, which is the bedroom. And she says, Behold, our bed is green with life. So first of all, the bed is a place of rest, obviously. The only time that we can truly rest is when we've understood how the work got finished. That it's not mine to do anymore. I don't have to lay awake like I do sometimes now, wondering if I'm going to be able to mow the grass tomorrow or if it's going to rain or if it's going to be so hot I'll stroke out out there someplace or whatever. You know what I mean? Just the stuff yeah. that kind of lingers out there and hangs out yeah. over your head. Amen. But if I know it's all done, I sleep like a baby. I don't have to worry if I get up early enough or get ahead of the sun or before the rain falls or before some other issue or whatever happens. Amen. So he said, this, this is the idea that the, the rest that we have in him is complete. Yes. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The bed was green. Remember last week, those of you that were here, the rainbow around the throne? He said it was green like an emerald. Amen. In sight, he says, as an emerald. And that also speaks of a place of intimacy because... When we enter into a new level of intimacy, Hallelujah. 
love relationship. We come into this mercy seat and two become one. We become one with him. Amen? When he takes her into this green room, he restores her soul. That's, again, what we talked about last week, Psalms 23. In Psalms 23, let's look at this quickly, Peter, if you will. Psalms 23, verses 1 and 2. When we enter into that place, that place of intimacy, it's a new level of intimacy. It's, this, it's actually this love relationship that he's calling us to. He tears down the barrier so that we can come to the mercy seat, or, which is just another word for the propitiation of our faith, which is mercy seat. It's, it's all the same. It's talking about Jesus, praise the Lord. And so in this mercy seat, two become one. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. So in this, in this union and restoration, are you with me? Yeah. In this coming together and this restoration, praise the Lord, conception takes place. And you become the bearer, the seed of the king. Now, again, this is what was awkward for me when I got the, the tape series from Suzanne because I'm thinking, wait a minute, I'm a guy. He's a guy. You know what I mean. You know where our heads go with all this stuff, and it just didn't make any sense to me at all. But, again, we, if we're, when we miss the symbolism, when we miss the metaphorical teaching here, we're missing the point. We're not getting the spiritual truth from it. We're just getting a bunch of literature or acts of functions. Amen? And the book of Revelation is no different. It, it's more extreme, but it's still doing the same thing. It's still doing it the same way. Amen? And so when, you, when we come into this place of intimacy that we're talking about in this last day, what happens? We give birth to his baby. Yes. Now, don't mess me up with <laughs> physical stuff. That's not what we're talking about, obviously. We give birth to the full-grown man-child yes. that he talks about in Ephesians 4. When we all come to the full stature, the, the fullness of in us to overflow amen that's the last that's in the last days amen it's more than theology it is relationship that's the point that he's trying to get us to understand he's going to bring us into this dimension of rest this place of peace this place of intimacy this place of outpouring or birthing again amen of god's spirit in the earth praise the lord psalms 92 verse 10 I'm glad to be living in the last days. Yes. We're going to experience stuff nobody's experienced. When we get to heaven, amen, when we transition this thing, those people that we have been jealous of, if you will, or envious of their experiences, they're feeling the same thing. They're thinking, I wish I could have just waited a couple thousand years to be born. I mean, I, I, that was great, but man, what's coming? Amen. It'll put a, it'll put a blanket over that com in comparison. Amen. But he says, but my horn shall thou exalt like the horn of a unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Amen. Again, that's the outpouring, this latter day outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So Jesus lived from heaven to earth. Amen? He lived from the heaven's reality toward earth. We have a tendency to do the opposite. We live from earth's experiences and try to get to heaven. Amen? Try to make that reality ours. He was just the opposite. He lived from that reality to here. Amen? In Psalms 92, the word that word fresh is actually resen. It's a Hebrew word. That means green. It's another word for green. Amen. So he will give us a, what? A new, a green, a new anointing. Mm -hmm. Somebody say praise the Lord. Yeah. I mean, this is, makes sense to me. I, I mean, I'm seeing what God is trying to get us to understand in this last day. He's going to give us a new, a, a new anointing. And one of the identifiers, amen, of those people who are seated with him in heavenly places, amen, is they are kings and priests. 
They're seated on the throne with him, in the throne with him, amen, and he calls us a nation of kings and priests. We are kings and priests. Look at Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 1. The big debate is Jesus, was Jesus, uh, you know, was Melchizedek Jesus? Was it just a manifestation of him somehow? Or was this a literal thing or whatever? But for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, he was a king and priest. Praise the Lord. Who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. We are part of the Melchizedek priesthood. Jesus was the only one identified with it in the new covenant. Amen. Now, right, now let's look at this. Revelation chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Remember now, let's don't jump off the cliff here and think that these are some kind of gargoyles or something. We are all beasts. I mean, in terms of our physical humanity, it's, it's talked about in the Bible different times. Uh, the beast that rises up, the, one of the beasts, the nature of the beast is human. It's humanity. Right? I mean, it's, it's a lower level. It's not spirit. It's human. It's just a level above the other animals. It's still a beast in terms of relationship or, or comparison to God. And so he said, before the throne, there was a sea blast on the country, in the midst of the throne. Round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind, and actually if you look it up, the word the, that word beast translates living creatures. We are all born again. New creations, new creatures in Christ. I'm not trying to make that the point here, I'm just saying. Just stay open here. And in the midst of the throne, round about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. The first beast was like a lion. Second beast like a calf. Third beast had a face as a man. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And I could, we could go into all that stuff because there's all kinds of other metaphorical things referred to this throughout the Bible, but for the sake of time, the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was, which is, and which is to come. Praise the Lord. So this Holy Spirit ministry, amen, is flowing from the throne and out of the kingdom of God is going to be a people who have a vision for every realm. For the natural and for the supernatural. For the earthly and the heavenly. Amen? For the physical and for the spiritual. Full of eyes. We have eyes before and eyes behind. We can see what God's done and what he's doing and know what he's going to do. Within and without. The result is, he's telling us we're involved in every realm. We've tried to make the spirit realm manifest here. And he's telling us in these last days, as we begin to understand our true identity, who we are, what God has done for us, we're going to be flowing in and out of these dimensions. Praise the Lord involved in every realm, just like Jesus was. He's here. They try to throw him off a cliff. He's not here anymore. He, he went into another realm and he just shows up again someplace else. Praise the Lord. Be open to the outrageous because that's why it happened the way it happened in the first century. They believed. They just believed all things are possible. And unless we get back to that place and get past this IQ thing, this, this into, intellect, amen, we're not going to move any further than we've ever moved. This is about understanding God has prepared us for a special, amen, for the time in memorial. Praise God. Let, let's look at this last scripture and we'll close. Psalms 149. And we'll read the whole 149. It's not long. It's only... Praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song. I mean, I'm telling you, I believe this is God talking to us in this last day. Amen. A new song. Praise the Lord. Amen. In other words, you're getting some stuff you didn't know before. Amen. 
and his praise in the congregation of the saints. Let Israel rejoice in him that made him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praises unto him with the timbrel and the harp. For the Lord shall take taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and the two-edged sword in their hand. Yes. To execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people. To bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. To execute upon them the judgment written. This sounds to me like God's got us involved in what we have thought mm. was judgment of the devil coming to do this. Mm. He says we're going to judge angels. Praise the Lord. We're involved in some stuff here that I don't think we've ever Woo! really thought about or, or got involved in with. Amen. Wow. To execute upon them the judgment written. This honor have all his saints. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Ooh. I'm saying that's the latter rain. Yeah. Praise God. That's the latter rain. Because he saved the best for last. Yes. And we get to be a part of it. Not because of anything we've done, but because he foreknew. Yes. Amen. And what God knows is that Somehow, some way, we will believe. We will move into this dimension. Amen. We will start to function. Amen. The way He is. It has to happen, church. It has to happen. This is the Word of God. And we've made it so much about following rules and doing this and doing the other. And I'm not against morality or being, you know, decent people. We need to. We need to be an example. But the biggest, the greatest example we're ever going to make is to be a revelation of Jesus Christ. And that doesn't just mean how nice I am. That means the power that goes with the name. Hallelujah. The, uh, the authority, the ability to change circumstances, to change lives. Amen. To see what's coming. Amen. Behind. To see what's coming ahead. Amen. And to be able to move in and out of those realms in a way that can be impacting. Amen. The world around us. So that the people who think... Oh, yeah, it's nice they've got this religion. Well, get past the fact that this is not about religion. This is about a life-changing, life-saving, eternal condition that God wants you operating in. Amen. And we, we felt, I mean, I know personally there's been times I get a little embarrassed to, 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 do, to step out, you know, and declare or prophesy or whatever. Amen. Because you feel like you're drawing attention to yourself. But that's not the case here. He's telling us this, all it's going to draw attention to is God. If we're doing it like he intends us to do it, amen, trusting in him, resting in him, the, 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 the Holy Spirit will flow, amen, because God's shaking the bottle and popping the cork, amen. It's God that's doing it. He's getting us stirred up to the place where just our presence, amen, can overflow just like it did with Peter when his shadow healed somebody or when Jesus is walking through, the people are touching him and getting healed and, and delivered and everybody who believed yes. received. And that's where we're headed, church. Amen. 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 Oof, praise the Lord. The latter rain, the best. Yes. He's saving for last. Amen. Amen. We ought to give him thanks for that. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Thank you so much for your patience. Ron, if you want to share something, go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Amen. to give up your past, your failures, and enter into your future. He says, it will happen, and it will be by my grace, he says. Yes. Amen. 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 Nobody, will get the, nobody gets the glory but God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's the way it's set up. We know it is. Praise the Lord. Give me one other hand clap. Praise God. That's it. Give up your past for his future. Amen. Suzanne. Uh, so, ever since about Eastern Gate House of Prayer, the Lord's been telling me to bind the tormentor. And I, I don't know, I just, I don't know why I've been quiet about it, but I've been asking, like, what are you talking about, tormentor? And I believe that there are some long-standing issues in people's lives that the enemy has come to torment them with. Yeah. 
And whatever that issue is, whatever, whatever has been tormenting you, the Lord is telling me right now in the name of Jesus, yes. that tormentor is bound yes. and sent back yes. to hell from whence he came. Yes. yes. Praise and the Lord. right now I release life and peace yes. where there has been torment and pain and suffering in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Receive it in Jesus' name by faith right now. Praise, the Lord. Praise God. He's a good God. Yes. It's not just about the promises. It's about his goodness. You can have confidence in the promise. Because we know the promise is coming from the good God. Amen. He'll never fail you. He'll never leave you or forsake you. Amen. And gosh, what a tremendous uh, blessing for us. Think about this. There's something special about this generation. This last generation that God has chosen to reveal himself in the most powerful way that he ever has. Would you not suspect that the enemy would be mad as hell? Hmm? And maybe that's why so much crap goes on and we're struggling and issues come and they go and we think we've got the victory here and then bang, you get blindsided by something else. Of course, because the devil knows yeah. and trembles. Yeah. He knows God and he knows God in you. And whenever you act like it, he freaks out. So he's got to do everything he can, just like he did with Adam, to rob your identity, to convince you, amen, that God is not for you, that God's not a good God. He's withholding something. He's holding something back until you get really good. No. He's yeah. declared you to be the righteousness of God in him. Amen. And he's a good God. And he's got nothing but good for us. Amen. We just got to believe it. Praise the Lord. I have to say that when you prayed over us, you know, and then we end up missing two weeks. Mm -hmm. I know that the enemy was coming against us. Yep. And I know that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and powers. Yes, exactly. And that is what is happening with Eric now. Sure. But him going through that, I feel like God is just doing something greater than me. Yes, yes. Yep. Amen. All things will work together for good. Doesn't say all things are good, but they will work together for good if you don't depart from confidence in God. If you don't, I mean, I know it's hard, but and I said that the following week. Everybody that I had prayed for, I said, how many of you have seen the opposite effect? Or a negative effect rather than the what was prayed. Yeah. Because the minute you speak the word, the devil comes. And he wants us to be so paranoid that we'll quit speaking the word. Yeah. Because he knows that's what defeats him every time. And so he's got to use, he's, whenever we get a prayer uh, or a prophecy over us or any of those kinds of things, what happens? Immediately the devil will come either with some sickness or with a financial issue or a relational thing. Anything to get you off of the mark from where God is trying to move you and cause you to get into fear or anxiety and stress and all those things so that you can't move in the flow of the Holy Spirit. He knows you have the victory. He knows you are more powerful than Him. He knows you're just like Jesus. You could whip Him every day of the week, all week long, all day long, if you stay in your identity, if you stay in whom God has declared you to be. God will use those things to bring you into a greater purpose. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Jesus said he was going through it, man. I mean, he knew. He identified himself. He said, I know. I, this is my call. This is what I'm supposed to do. And he was in the garden ready to just find any way out of this mess that I can find. I mean, he was in serious angst, you know, anguish. And then he comes to the place where the grace of God, the goodness of God brings peace to him. And he says, but nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Amen. And it said with joy, he looked on the things that were to come. I'm not saying he was happy, but I'm saying he knew there was the joy of what was to come yes. was greater than the momentary issue that he was dealing with. Yes. And that's where we have to keep our focus. The joy that's set before us, Christ himself, God, eternity. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord is greater than anything we might be going through in, in the moment. Amen. And the way to overcome the thing we're going through in the moment is to put your attention back on him. Put your focus back on him. He's going to use everyone that is usable. And everybody's usable if they just will. For whosoever will. Amen. Praise the Lord. I, I, I'm so excited because when this stuff opens up and we see... All, think about all of the
days, the weeks, the months, the times we've wondered about how's God going to do this? How's he going to do this? Will he do this? Won't he do this? How's it going to happen? All of a sudden, yes. it's gone. It'll be as though it never existed. The joy is so much greater than the suffering. And the suffering is simply to believe. That's, he's not talking about God's beating us up with whips or something. He's saying the suffering we go through is to believe the way Jesus believed in the joy that's set before us. Praise the Lord. Amen. Give the Lord one more hand. Praise God. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Have a great week. Praise God.